What Jesus endured for us has captured the imagination of people for generations and for millennia. And the reason we focus on it is not to inspire guilt, but rather to inspire gratitude. Uh, Jesus went through absolutely horrific things, and he didn't do it to prove that he could, or even to prove how bad we were. He did it to prove how much he loves us, how many are grateful for the love of God. Amen? Yeah. Um, as it turns out, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and the next message in the Gospel of Matthew happens to deal with the theme of Good Friday. So you're actually getting the next part of Matthew. And it says in Matthew 16, verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. There's just no way to make that sound good. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to serve their, save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. If you remember, Peter had just been praised for getting it right. Jesus told him after he says, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You are Peter. I'm going to use you to build a great church. And, and now Peter says something, and Jesus says something very different than uh, something of praise. Why is Jesus talking about this? It's really interesting. It says, from that time on, this is the turning point in Matthew's gospel. From now on, Jesus is aimed towards Jerusalem and he's focused on the cross. But there's something else going on here too. And that is, Jesus wants them to know not only who he is, but how he's going to fulfill his mission. And it's very different than what the disciples have been imagining. The methods of Jesus are not the methods of the world system. So from that time on, Jesus just keeps reminding the disciples, there's a cross in my future. There's a death in my future. God is going to raise me up. And he's not just telling them something that's going to happen to kind of prepare them. He's telling them something that is God's will, and he's telling them something to train them. That this isn't just something Jesus is doing for us. He's calling us to a way to follow him. And that's a very different way of thinking than people had in ancient cultures or quite honestly in ours. He's not just preparing, he's also training. And what's happening in this moment is there's a collision of, of, of what God's will is supposed to be. And most people assume if you're in God's will, everything goes great. And Jesus is telling them, in God's will, I'm going to suffer. And so Peter actually goes into protection mode. Uh, if we know that someone we love is going to suffer, we do the exact same thing. And so he goes into protection mode. And he pulls Jesus aside, and he rebukes him. I guess that being called uh, Peter and on this rock I will build my church just went to his head a little bit. And so he pulls Jesus aside, never, this can't happen. And this is what I want you to hear. We don't just get things wrong when we follow our bad thoughts. 
Sometimes we get things wrong when we follow our good thoughts. He loves Jesus. He wants to protect Jesus. This idea that as long as you love someone or something, you will always get it right. Peter shows us that we can actually get completely off track. We're as capable of sinning out of love as out of hate. In fact, some of the greatest sins in, in our history have been caused by someone who claimed that they loved their country, their leader, their family, their history, their traditions. So Jesus needed his disciples to see that he came to save through suffering. And Peter's view of the church is that, and of spirituality is when you're getting spirituality right, nothing bad happens to them. And this really is the way Jesus saw this is a form of worldliness. We think that worldliness is being enticed to take things easier, uh, spend unwisely, uh, be a little bit more selfish, uh, those kinds of things. But it's also a kind of worldliness to assume that if we follow Jesus, that somehow we are exempt from ever having a challenge, ever going through a difficult season, ever having to bear a burden, ever having to, to be in a relationship where reconcile has to happen because it hasn't happened yet. And so Jesus wants to confront this. And, and he, he says, I must, I must go to Jerusalem. But for us, when something bad happens, how often do we say, I must have done something wrong. And now that's why I'm suffering. It's astonishing. I've been doing ministry uh, longer than I want to admit. And what I can tell you is, is that when people find themselves in very difficult situations, often what they will say, I wonder what it is that I did wrong that God is punishing me for. And all I can tell you is a couple of things. One is this is not heaven. How many already figured that out? <laughs> for some of you, I know, I, I just uh, shattered something. But it's not heaven. And in heaven, it's not going to be the, the painful things that we have to endure and deal with here won't be there. And, and, and it's a broken world, and, and things can happen because we go out of bounds, but things can happen just because other people go out of bounds too. And we can be the recipients of other people's actions or inactions. So what did Jesus say? He says, get behind me, Satan. Why did he say Satan? Because there's no way to make that sound complimentary. I, I know lots of people today, uh, uh, we use different language for different things. I, I was talking to somebody on staff the other day, and I was talking about a, a place that I had been, and, and they were working on something, and, and they said, well, how did it go? I said, they killed it. And, and they said, oh, it was that good. I said, no, they killed it. It's dead. It's, it's, it's gone. <laughs> and different, different kind of language, you know? Uh, even if you call someone a dog, there's actually ways to do that as a compliment. I've never heard Satan used as a compliment. It's just not there. Why? Because Jesus recognizes a similar temptation that he had faced when he was in the wilderness. And what Satan was telling him is, you can leap off this building and nothing bad will ever happen to you because you're the son of God. If you're really the son of God, bad things don't happen. If you're really spiritual, bad things don't happen. If you really pray enough, bad things don't happen. If you read enough scripture, bad things don't happen. If you show up in rooms like this enough, bad things don't happen. And Jesus understood the temptation. And he rebukes it. He calls it out. He understands that all that has to happen, if we start acting like that, every time we're heading towards something fruitful, every time we're moving towards maturity, every time we're leaning into something that can be beneficial in God's kingdom and in others' lives, all Satan has to do is to create some, some tumult, some, some conflict, some resistance, some tension, some pain, some heaviness, some whatever it is. And, and what happens? We'll just, we'll veer away from it because our assumption is, well, if I'm a child of God, it's all easy. And Jesus knows we can't live our life like that. What's also interesting is that after he uses the Satan remark, he also tells them, get behind me, which is not the same thing as saying, get away from me. Jesus is not done with Peter, but he is telling him, you're supposed to be following me, and now you're in front of me. How did that happen? G Peter is trying to lead 
Jesus instead of following Jesus. And he's become a stumbling block because what concerns God does not concern Peter. Peter is caught up with human concerns. And here's the challenge. Some of us actually come to believe that we care more about people and about circumstances than God does. And it's not true. But God knows the actual price to make things right. And he's unrelenting about pursuing that. He's come to redeem the fallen. Peter is just trying to protect a friend. Now, it's not enough to point to Christ. We are called to follow Christ. And here's the thing. We can't follow Jesus if we are avoiding crosses. It's not how it works. Cross avoidance is a, has, has to get in front of Jesus. Cross avoidance has to try to correct Jesus. So Jesus challenged his disciples. He told them, not only am I going to take up my cross, but you need to take up your cross. Discipleship is a call to follow Jesus. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. And somebody says, well, I've been denying myself all Lent. I gave up chocolate. And, and I can tell you, that would be a huge sacrifice for me. You know, I, I like chocolate. I don't have a sweet tooth. I have sweet teeth. They're, they're all, they're all like that. No, self-denial isn't just what I'm not going to enjoy. Self-denial is about giving up the title of Lord in our lives and giving it to Jesus. And he says, take up their cross. Disciples should take up. What does that mean? It's voluntary. It's not imposed on you. God has not come to impose crosses. But for those who want to participate in a redemptive plan in our world, there are, there are crosses to bear. And he says, take up their cross, which means that each cross is a little bit different. And, and this is frustrating to us because sometimes it feels like and it looks like our cross is a lot bigger and a lot heavier and a lot more painful than somebody else's cross. Theirs looks like an ornament on their lapel and ours looks like something that we can't move even if it had wheels. And so we get frustrated by that. There are unique realities, but there's also some risks to cross-bearing that we don't think about. And one of the risks is that we can be really frustrated with other people who aren't bearing their crosses. I mean, we get frustrated at people, right? That's the quietest this room has ever been. <laughs> well, that and when I talk about sex, you know, it just goes... <laughs> uh, you know, if you're driving on the throughway, and you get behind two tractor trailers, one tried to pass the other, but now they're going uphill, and neither one of them are going the speed limit. And I'm, in, I'm behind them trying to keep from blacking out from a lack of oxygen, because we're not moving. And we get frustrated. We get frustrated with long lines, and we get frustrated with short fuses, and we get, we get all this frustrated. And we get frustrated when we think people aren't pulling their weight. We see the sacrifices that we're making, and we look at others, and it seems like they're not. And that can be a really deadly thing for us to do, because when we start comparing ourselves to others, you can always find someone who's doing less. And then the other thing that happens is we can kind of take a pride in, in how much we're enduring and how much we're caring. And, and it's not just about serving Jesus. It's about making a statement to others so they can appreciate. The purpose of following Jesus is to be with Jesus. That's why we follow him. It's not for an acknowledgement. It's not to prove something to anybody. It's just to be with the one who is willing to lay his life down for us. So Jesus would go on to the Last Supper, and I want to take this passage from Mark's Gospel. It says they went to a place called, called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. They'd not seen Jesus like this before. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. They'd never heard him talk like this before. Stay here and keep watch. What is he saying? I can't be alone right now. I need you to be with me. 
Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it's if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to say to him. The moment Jesus had been talking to them about from Matthew chapter 16 was now arriving. And Jesus became deeply distressed and very troubled. And he used words like, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. His hour had come. Jesus in that moment was searching in God's will to see if there was any other option than the one that he knew was right in front of him. And his prayer really has three points. And the first thing is everything is possible. That's really hard to acknowledge when it feels like Everything is going wrong. Everything is possible to God. But our challenge is if we acknowledge that and we think that something is possible, the next question we'll ask ourselves is why isn't he doing anything then? Why won't he take this from me? And here's the thing. Our lack of understanding of what God is doing does not need to devalue or reduce our value of who God is. Jesus starts his prayer. I know everything is possible to you. And then he says, take this cup from me. There are things I don't want to endure. There is pain I don't want to experience. There is sin I don't want to bear. I don't want to go through this event. There's, the pain is too intense. And the thing is, is Jesus is not a masochist. He doesn't find some kind of relief or pleasure in the pain that he's going to be facing. But he also would not allow the fear of the cup that was placed before him to keep him from drinking it. And so he finds himself asking God, is there any other way? And what I want you to know, it's not wrong to, to tell God you don't like what's going on right now. And it's not wrong to ask God to fix what's going on right now. But we have to be cautious that we don't assume we understand the power and the greatness of God because we don't understand what he's doing. I told you earlier, I've done ministry a long time. And I've listened to people who have gone through unbelievable tragic circumstances. And if you ask them if they would go through it again, they would tell you no. But as you continue to talk and listen over time, you hear how God was at work. And how he worked redemption. And who came to faith in Christ. And what relationship was restored. And how God was at work in all of it. And it's so easy to fall into the idea that the only way God can work in our way, in our world, is if there's a smile on our face. And a song in our heart. And Jesus is not singing right now. He's pleading with his father. He's not going to become defiant. He's not going to become disobedient. He doesn't want to listen to the accusations that will be made of him. He doesn't want to experience nails being pounded into his hands and feet. He doesn't want a crown of thorns placed upon his head or the lashes of whips across his back. He doesn't want a spear placed in his side. He doesn't want any of that, but there's something that he wants more than what he wants. He wants his Father's will. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up.
there's someone he trusts more than himself. If Jesus had tapped out in that moment, had gotten up and walked away, we would have no reason for hope. We would be trying to earn our own salvation and always feel the weight of our own insufficiencies and live with constant insecurities. We would see God as a tyrant who looks for reasons to punish instead as a father who throws his arms open wide and opens the door for us. Our sins wouldn't be atoned for. Our guilt wouldn't be relieved. Our shame would not be removed. We would be without hope. But because Jesus embraced the cross, none of those things are true. Not one. Our sins have been washed away. We sense the presence of the Father near. And when we have to bear burdens that seem too great for us, we discover someone who comes up under that burden with us. He never leaves. He never forsakes. It's all because of what was accomplished at the cross. If Jesus tried to save himself, he would have to have abandoned his mission. So I have a question for you. Do you believe that God can do anything? Because for some of us in the room, maybe the, the pain and the difficulties we've had to go through have made us suspicious about how much God can actually accomplish in our world or how much attention he's actually giving to us. Are you going through some things right now that you would like God to spare you from? There are people who are facing unbelievable darkness. They live with unceasing pain. They struggle to make even the simplest of decisions. They find themselves feeling incredibly lonely. Their pace and their cadence has no confidence in it. And their natural, defense, their natural position in life is to try to defend themselves from what they are sure is going to be something painful. This is the state of the human world, and it's why Jesus has come to us. The question is, are you willing to deny yourself and take up your cross? Are you willing to say this? Is there something you can work redemptively in what I'm going through? Because Father, if you can work something redemptively, if someone can come to know you because of this, if some relationship can be restored because of this, if something can happen that brings a smile to your face, I will do what you are asking me to do. That's the question. Will we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus? In the seat back in front of you, or if you're in the front rows, there's some of these underneath the seat. And by the way, uh, for those who uh, are gluten-free, we actually have two stands back by the, the sound booth, one on each side, and those are gluten-free options. Please feel free to go and snag those. Jesus understands brokenness. He endured it for us. It's one of my favorite things about the Last Supper. Jesus said these words, this is my body, which is broken for you, not by you, for you. Father, we're grateful for what your son was willing to endure. We're grateful that he knew you could do anything. 
And we're grateful that he didn't deny what was going on in his heart and in his mind. But we're also grateful that he prioritized your will and he trusted you more than himself in that moment. And the result is, is that we are forgiven. The result is, is that we are redeemed. The result is we are being made whole because of him. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll partake of the bread. Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Jesus didn't just do something to prove he could. He was making a promise. And his promise is that he would never leave us, even in the hard times. He would never forsake us, even when we forsake him. That this is not about our perfection. It's about his perfection and his mercy and goodness to us. So Father, I ask that you would help us to take up our own cross, not just to prove we can. I ask that you would help us to deny ourselves, not just to put ourselves down in this world, but that we do these things because we want to follow you. We want to be with you. Your promises, you will always be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll partake of the cup. And would you all stand? <clears throat>